we are going to move on to talking about cover crops and weed control again. And to do that, we have two wonderful presenters. First, we'll have Gina Nichols, who's a graduate student at Iowa State University, who researches diversified cropping systems. And then we'll hand it off to Rick Clark, who farms with his family in Warren County, Indiana, where they have 7,000 acres, and they've been using cover crops for 10 years and are in the process of transitioning to organic. So Gina, I will let you take it away. Great, right. thank you, Lydia. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you for coming. Um, slide. Thanks, Liz. So as Lydia mentioned, I'm a PhD student, and as part of my dissertation, I'm looking at how cover crops affect weeds. So today I'm here to tell you about a project that I just finished where I worked with the Practical Farmers of Iowa to see what happens to weeds when you use a rye winter cover crop consistently for at least 10 years. So before I tell you about the results, I want you to, no, you're good, slide. <laughs> um, before I tell you about the results, I want to talk about different ways to think about weeds. So um, I want you to close your eyes and imagine a weedy field. So now walk into your weedy field and spread your arms out. And now turn in a circle. Now pull out all of the weeds that fell within that circle. And now drag them out of that field and put them on a scale. Okay, open your eyes. Um, slide. You just took a measurement of weed biomass. So this is really important as all of that biomass represents things that were stolen from your crop. You know, it's stealing light, it's stealing water, stealing nitrogen, it's all stolen. But you could have pulled out just one giant weed or 30 tiny weeds. So now, um, in your mind's eye, look at your weed pile and count the number of weeds you dragged out. Slide. So this is the weed density. So these are the two most common weed measurements, and they tell you a lot about your weed pressure. But there is um, one more measurement, and you can't physically see it in your weedy field, but it is I would argue the one of the most important things to think about, and that is, slide, the number of weed seeds contained in the soil. So the weeds that you see are just an expression of the weed seed bank. So really, our long-term goal is to shrink the size of the seed bank because less weed seeds in the soil mean less potential for your weeds to become weedy. So based on the spiel, you can probably guess which one um, we measured in my project slide. It was the weed seed bank slide. So more about the project. Um, practical farmers had collaborators that had replicated strip trials where a winter rye cover crop had been planted every year in the same place for um, 10 years. And it was next to strips that get a winter rye cover crop. Um, all of the fields were corn soybean rotations, but you can see there's one field in Boone County that harvested the corn in that rotation for silage every year. So we wanted to know the size of the weed seed bank in each of those strips, the cover crop strips and the no cover crop strips. And we thought this would tell us if the long-term cover cropping was having any effect on the weed seed bank. So on the right, you can see Michaela Stallman. Uh, she was an undergrad at the time, and she was a great helper. She's standing in the Green County field in early spring when we took the measurements, and she has the totality of the equipment that we used for this. You can see that includes a bucket, a piece of PVC, and a mallet. Um, so I do want to take a second to tell you how we measured the weed seed bank, because I think it's a really great straightforward project that could be really easily done in other settings. Um, for example, I know Andrea Bache, who we heard from yesterday, is doing something similar in Nebraska with their strip trials. And so anyone who has cover crop strip trials could do this project. Slide. So um, what we did is we just took PVC and cut off pieces from it um, at a specified length. We hit them into the ground to a specified depth and we pulled them out, scraped the soil into a bucket, and you rinse and repeat. You do that 20 times in each strip. Then you take your bucket 
uh, your bucket home essentially, and you put the soil in a warm place full of light slide. So we put it in a greenhouse. Um, and at this point, you just have to water it and, and water it and water it. And actually, Lydia English, one of the organizers for today's event, um, helped me water this. So as you water it, you identify and pull out the weeds as they come up. Um, slide. Yeah, there you go. So um, this is a picture of some of the trays that I let grow, grow long enough so I could get a picture of the weeds. And it might be hard to see through internet land, but what do you notice? Um, you might notice that a lot of the weeds look the same, and it is. It's because most of the weeds are water hemp. So in fact, over 90% of the weed seeds that we found were water hemp. Slide. So this figure shows how many weed seeds we found in total, separated by cover crop treatment and weed. So this again reiterates that we found about 10 times more water hemp than any other weed. Lamb's quarter came in a distant second, but really it was just like water hemp city. And it seems like a great time to mention that water hemp has developed resistance to seven herbicide groups at last count. Um, so the fact that we see less water hemp seeds in the cover crop treatments is really important. And it's also very exciting because producers really need a way to fight water hemp. And it seems like cover crops can be a really effective way to do that. Slide. So here I'm showing the results separated by field. So we had four fields that we measured. Um, and there's a, a dotted line that represents sort of a rough average for a seed bank size in the Midwest, which was based on a survey done back in 2007. So that's just there to give you some context for these numbers. Um, so in both the Green County field and the silage field in Boone County, the cover crop strips had less than half the um, number of wheat seeds compared to the control strips. Um, and the, the other two fields, the Washington and um, the other Boone field, there were, um, there were no differences between the strips, but I also wanna say they both had very small seed banks to begin with, which you can tell they're, they're, they're way below average. Um, so there wasn't actually a lot of room for the cover crop to work. So that's again, just to provide some context. So these results provide evidence um, that long-term cover cropping does have an effect on your weed seed bank. So, um, while growing big, lush cover crops is a really good goal, these sites weren't growing massive amounts of cover crop biomass to get these reductions. Um, in fact, each of these fields, I think, had one, at least one year where the cover crop really didn't do much. They planted it every year, but some years you might only get 200 pounds per acre of biomass. So you can see that Green County, for example, got really drastic changes in its weed seed bank, but it was only averaging 400 pounds per acre. So again, don't get me wrong, cover crop biomass is really important. Um, we've seen some really incredible pictures of cover crops so far, but this project would suggest that slide. Um, fields that look like this um, you're, are still giving you a lot of benefits with respect to weeds. So this study was just published um, last week, actually, and it's open source, so anyone can read it. So I'll add a link to the chat if you're interested in it. But lastly, a lot of speakers have talked about um, managing expectations. And so I also think it's important to have realistic expectations of how much cover crop biomass you might get given the constraints of your operations. So I built an online interactive tool to help give you an idea slide. So this is a screenshot of it. Um, and you just you select your state, your county and a rye planting date. And the figure will show you the ranges of biomasses you might get. So for example, this is Story County in Iowa where I live. And it shows that if I plant a cover crop on October 7th, if I terminate it on say, um, May 1st, 
In a bad year, I would get less than a thousand pounds per acre of biomass, but if it's a really good year, I could get 3,000 pounds. Um, so this, this comes from um, using a model with historical weather data, but I did send it to Rick, who's going to talk next, who lives in Indiana, and I also sent it to Nathan, who talked yesterday, um, and they both said it seemed to match with they, their experiences. So I'll share that link in the chat also. Um, Note that it was a personal project, so it can only handle 25 users at a time. So if you try to use it and it doesn't let you in, just try a little bit later. So with that, I'll turn it over to Rick and he'll tell us how he uses cover crops for weed control. Well, thank you, Gina. That was, that was awesome. Um, let me get my screen where I need to be here. We all good to go there, is that good? I am not seeing it. No, yet. I'm sorry. I'm no sorry. worries. Take your time. Share screen. There we go. Now we see you, Rick. Okay. Now, I'm sorry about this, folks. We'll get there in a moment. It looks good now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Gina, thank you. Uh, and yes, your calculator, that is awesome. I went and looked at that uh, 20 seconds to fill in the information and boom, there was, there was the data. That's, that's awesome, thank you. Um, good morning, I'm honored to be here today. Thank you, we'll talk a little, I gotta move quick here, so let's go. Uh, I'll get a little history about what I'm doing so you'll understand why we uh, cover crops are so important in our system. Five crop system, uh, uh, corn, soybeans, wheat, alfalfa, peas, and then the plus one is a region, and that's where we can uh, leave, leave acres out of production for cash crops, and we can throw massive cocktails at these acres and get them prepared for the next cash crop. We have 1,200 acres of certified organic ground currently. The remainder of the farm is in total transition to organic. We use no starter, no starter fertilizer, no fungicides, no seed treatments, no insecticide. We've not applied any phosphorus for seven years. We've not applied any potassium for seven years. And we have not applied any ag lime for seven years. And we do continue to soil test and all of our tests are, are holding where they were seven years ago or maybe slightly lower, but nothing like you would, you would think if you just started taking inputs away. Um, this is a very advanced system, so we, we can't just go out tomorrow and start doing these things I've got on the screen. It takes many years to get to this point, but believe me, it, it is worth it. Uh, no, nit no nitrogen applied in two years, and that includes manure. So we are doing everything naturally, and we are growing our nitrogen. So again, these cocktails are so critical to our weed suppression. And I've mentioned on here that we are going organic, but we are way beyond organic, folks. We are doing this with no tillage. So this is a three pass system. It's a, it's a pass in the fall of planting a cover crop. It's a, plat, a pass in the spring of a no-till planting your cash crop. And then it's a mechanical termination pass. And that's all we're doing. So the the cover crop biomass is absolutely imperative for our system. Um, next year's cash crop begins with the, su the success of this year's cover crop. Let that soak in for just a moment there. We've got to get these cover crops planted in timely fashions in the fall. Stability, this is an awesome chart. Um, Beef, as we were as we were going through our journey on the left side of the of the chart of corn, you see that the two lines have really separated from each other. Where they come together is when we're really grooving on cover crop and standard deviation here is yield variance. So before the implementation of cover crops, we would have almost 29 bushels of yield variance in a corn field. And now with the impl implementation of cover crops, we've reduced that to less than five bushels. So the system has become very stable. So the cover crops are doing so many benefits for, for the system here. 
and we have to be able to collect data to be able to get to these kind of, of, of charts that we can put up. Okay, I wanna to talk to you about, this is very powerful slide, but I wanna only really focus on the biomass part of this slide. Now, Gina was talking about cereal rye and I love cereal rye and it is one of our main staples on the farm and it is always planted ahead of soybeans. And if we have time in the fall, we will add other species to it to get diversification because diversity is very important here. Now, this is 12 inch tall rye. So let me, let me lay this out real quick. This was a field that was corn in the fall. We went in and planted 80 pounds of cereal rye in the, in the month of September. I think this was around September the 20th. And then that, that, that rye grew in the fall. It went into dormancy, came out of dormancy in the spring. And then we would go out and we would take a two foot by two foot square and clip all of the cereal rye that is above ground and ship it to the lab. And then this is, the, this is what we get back. So the one thing I ask people, even if you're still using chemicals on your farm, please do not go out and burn this cereal rye down on the first warm day of spring. That's about where we are right here, 12 inches. If you just give us four more days, it went, it went up to, I got to move something on my screen. I'm sorry. The biomass doubled and went to 4,000 pounds. Now this is, this is dry. This is the, the dry, this is dry matter taken into account. So this is what's actually there. Um, but look at the nitrogen, look at the nitrogen that has been pulled in by the cereal rye. And I want to now talk a little bit about, I want you to think about something. I've had a notion on this and I'm just going to put it out here today. Cereal rye is a tremendous sequester of nitrogen. So maybe what's happening here is the cereal rye is taking the fuel away that the weeds need to grow. And as that cereal rye has sequestered the fuel for the weeds and is held onto it, and then later on in the growing season, these nutrients are released. And then we have late season weeds come into the system like foxtail. I think if you start to think about the mechanics of what's happening here, I think this, this stuff starts to make some sense. 28 inch rye, 6,800 pounds of biomass. This is what we need in our system with no tillage to suppress weeds. So this is huge. Now, now this is what, there's more to this. Look at this slide here. This slide, uh, this, this dead rye line was taken two months after termination. And look where the biomass wound up. The microbes have eaten almost half of what we produced in, in this biomass. And now this rye was terminated with a roller crimper on June the 1st. So this dead sample was taken August the 1st. So it, and look at how much has been released back to the profile. I told you this was going to be a soybean field. Soybeans need potash. Look at the number that at 281 versus 65. That's how much has been released out of that cereal rye back into the profile for that plant to get a hold of. It's just tremendous. The power of Balanza fixation clover. Again, this is our main staple for going ahead of corn. We, we plant this because we can terminate it with a, a roller crimper. That's why I'm being very specific here in using fixation. Uh, May 20th, we have a biomass reading of 3,800 pounds. June the 4th, 6,800 pounds, and it has fixed 114 pounds of in. Same way we do it, two feet, two foot by two foot square, clip it all off at the ground, ship it to the lab, and they, they give us back these results. Now, just look what happens if we could wait four days. From June the 4th to June the 8th is unbelievable. 262 pounds of N, 442 pound, 44 pounds of K2O, 12,700 pounds of biomass. This is the fuel and the weed suppression for our system. Now we are on 20 inch row spacing corn and 20 inch row spacing soybeans. 
what my rule of thumb here is 70-30. 70% of the weed suppression has to come from the cover crop and 30% of the weed suppression is gonna come from the canopy of the cash crop. So it is imperative that we have both of these working in conjunction with each other. The sample that was taken on June 8th had 5,200 pounds of organic carbon. I mean, this stuff is off the chart, but it's taken us years to get to these levels. And remember, we haven't applied any P or K in seven years. So we are mineralizing, we are pulling the, these nutrients from deep within the profile, and we are trying to figure out how to unlock them and get them back to the future. Carbon to nitrogen ratio is 20 to one, as you would imagine with a legume. So this is going to burn up fast. In six weeks, it's pretty much gone. You can't see that anything was there. And that's exactly what you want to have happen for the fuel for the corn. And then we hope that we've gotten to a canopy position before all that uh, biomass has been burned up. I also call this the power of patience because we've waited until June the 8th to plant our corn here. This is not for everybody, but you can incorporate a lot of these ideas even into your system if you're still using chemicals. At least wait until May 28th to, to terminate this and you might be able to, to reduce your nitrogen bill by 25 or $30 an acre. Okay, um, rolling cereal rye ahead of the soybean planter. We typically don't do this, but you have to be flexible uh, for what mother nature's giving you. This is on June the 2nd, fields, it was very wet this spring. We couldn't get in the field. So we rolled the cereal rye at Anthesis and planted right behind it. Now, we just laid down 6,500 to 7,000 pounds of biomass. Look at that. The planter just drives right through it. You can't even hardly tell where the planter's been. And this now is the wheat suppressor for our soybeans for the rest of the season, July 22nd. That's the same field with organic soybeans in it. Look, that's just amazing to me that we can get this kind of weed suppression. August the 10th. Here's what I'm talking about. See the foxtail starting to creep through? I think if we think about the way mother nature is working and we're constantly trying to work within balance of mother nature, I think now that cereal rye is releasing a lot of those nutrients that not only the soybeans need, but are now going to help fuel some of the, the late season uh, weeds that are the weeds that come later in the season. Okay, this is our corn. This is another aspect of our corn pr uh, program. This is alfalfa. Now, this typically is a two year established stand of alfalfa. We are no tilling corn into this alfalfa right here in this, in this video. Now, this is more difficult than it looks, folks, that you have to have a corn that has good vigor and you have to have some stomach here because we are planting corn into a, a, a perennial plant that does not want to give up and it's going to take moisture and it's going to take nutrients away from this corn. So this is why we roll crimp. Uh, this is our 60 foot I and J uh, Chevron roller crimper. And what we're doing here is we are laying the, the alfalfa flat to the ground to, to start suppressing weeds. Of course, as you can see, there's hardly any weeds out there anyway, but it's gonna suppress weeds and it's gonna give fuel to the corn. Now we know that this will not terminate the alfalfa. We know that. What we're trying to do is give the corn a competitive advantage. And that's why we're doing this when the corn is at V1. So the corn is actually out of the ground and we are rolling this. Now I get asked a lot of times, Rick, why don't you just go in and mow, merge and chop and remove all of that alfalfa? There's a couple reasons why we don't do this. What has just left the field in those semis is, the is a lot of the nutrients that this cash crop needs to grow. And the other reason why we don't do this 
is because what does alfalfa want to do when you cut it? It wants to regrow and take nutrients out of the profile and moisture out of the profile. So all we're trying to do is slow the alfalfa down. Now let's go back to my 70-30 rule here. 70% uh, weed control with the cover crop, which I'm gonna call alfalfa here a cover crop, and 30% of, of cash crop canopy. So what we need to do is get the corn above the alfalfa and start to take off and being on 20 inch rows, we will canopy at about V5. And now the canopy, what it's doing for us is suppressing the alfalfa and it will actually terminate the, the alfalfa, the majority of it. It won't quite, it depends on how good of a corn stand you have. If you have good stands and good canopy, you will pretty much eliminate the alfalfa. And so that when that happens, then that alfalfa is releasing everything and your corn absolutely explodes. This is a picture of that same field. I try to keep everything the same in order so you know what's happening here. This particular corn was, was absolutely devastated by black cutworm twice. And this is what it looked like on August the 2nd. So this is the final practice, or this is the final pass of the system. And as you can see, there are no weeds poking through. This is exactly what Gina was referring to. We need biomass to get to these kind of positions. That's what I have for, for uh, on the presentation. Uh, let's open it up for, for questions. I will stop sharing my screen now. Okay. Great. Well, thank you, Rick and Gina. Those were both awesome presentations and we're getting a lot of questions in the chat box, which I will try to keep um, your way. Hey, Gina, I want to ask a question to you first, which is that um, can you talk a little bit about the trade off between getting like taking measurements on the actual weed seeds, like getting a number and the types of weed seeds versus germinating the weed seeds and like what that difference might show? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so we did the germination method. And so that gives us live weed seeds. And it also, um, it could underestimate um, some certain types of weeds. So we sampled in the spring, um, hoping to make sure that all of the seeds got that winter stratification that they might need in order to germinate. But not all weeds get it. They might have needed more. Um, so those weeds wouldn't have popped up in the method that we used. Um, there are methods where you, you wash the soil away and you just keep the seeds and you identify every single seed and then you do a, a test to see if the seed is viable. Um, it is very time consuming, um, very time consuming as you can imagine. So we opted for the, the, the germination method just because it's been shown to be a really effective way to compare systems. So while the absolute numbers might not be as informative, when you're just comparing systems, it's just as good as the extraction method, which is much more labor intensive, I guess. Thank you. That was great. Um, Rick, I'm going to fire off some technical questions at you that are coming in from the chat box. Um, so one is what is your, can you talk about your corn planting population when you're going into alfalfa? Sure. Uh, again, 20 inch rows. Uh, we are planting into a pretty hostile environment for, as, as considering a corn plant is concerned, 40,000 is what I'm dropping. I hope that the a harvest population is 34 to 36,000. Great. And can you talk about sort of like the average rainfall that you're getting in your part of the state of Indiana? Sure. It's uh, West Central Indiana, right on the Illinois line. We farm on both sides. It's about 36 to 40 inches of rain. So rain is not a, a limiting factor for the most part. Now we do on occasion though have three, which we had twice happen this year, two four week events of 95 degrees with no rain. That does uh, lean on the system a little bit. That's good to know. We did also had a, have a question about whether you've experienced any extreme weather events um, in the past seven years with refining the system. Do you have any other comment on that or just? 
Yes, we have. I mean, the weather events are, are no longer calm and predictable like they've been in, in when I was a child or growing up. They seem to be uh, storms that come from the west and the, the sky goes black and three and a half inches gets dropped in, in 25 minutes. So, um, you know, yes, but I, I like our system because with the armor on the soil, we're reducing that, that compaction that's being created by the rainfall. And when you get in between those rain events and you hit those 90 degree days and, and stretches of no rain, when you have armor on the soil, you have eliminated evaporation out of that profile. So all the more reason to have these cover crops. It's just, there are so many positives for no-till cover crop and I can't think of one negative. So I don't know why more people wouldn't do it. Here's a follow-up question to that. Do you have any advice for someone who wants to get started perhaps? Like how they, sh what are the first steps or what would be a good way to, to get into this sort of system? they've got to go easy and not get in over your head and don't get frustrated the the important thing is is to have success in that first year so for example i would if you're still in a chemical program i would definitely use cereal rye ahead of soybeans i would terminate the cereal rye uh, after i planted the soybeans in the spring and then with corn i would put out uh, oats uh, sorghum Sudan and tillage radish, but but there's more to that. I mean, this is very complex. Um, you can't just go out on November 1st and plant those three things I just said because they're all going to winter kill. So if you plant on November 1st, unless you're sitting in, in southern Georgia, you'd be fine. But if you're in the Midwest, you're not going to get any benefits. So you have to now back up and get these things that are these species that are going to winter kill need to be planted 45 days before the first for the first hard frost. And that's how I would get in. Um, I do have a consulting company. Uh, if you would go to the, my webpage, it's www.farmgreen.land and you can find more out about that. I'd, be, I'd love to help. I wanna teach people how to do the things that we're doing. That's great. And um, someone asked about um, if you're using shorter season corn and bean varieties than normal? These are great questions. Yes. I wish I could speak for an hour here, but yes, uh, we have shortened the relative maturities on our farm. Now where we farm, we are, uh, we are south of Iowa. We are south of all the whole state of Iowa. I'm pretty sure we are. Um, we were a 3.0 to a 4.2 soybean, 110 to 116 16 day corn is what we used to do. Now we are 1.7 to 2.6 soybeans, 98 to 106 day corn, because the importance of getting the cover crop planted in the fall in a timely fashion is absolutely imperative. It has to happen. I can show, I've got data. We've been collecting data on cereal rye for 15 years. I can show you that if you planted on September the 10th versus October the 10th, what that's going to have effect on in the spring, just like Gina's calculator is doing. It, she's taken a lot of the work out of this. I mean, it, what she's doing is, is, is groundbreaking and it needs to start moving out across other species so that then we can start a value. And I'm sure she's shaking her head. I'm sure she's gonna start doing things like that. So this just makes it easier for us farmers. So all the, the more people that get involved, the better this becomes. That's great, yeah. And just another plug to check out Gina's model because I think it's really awesome. Um, okay, I think we have time for uh, a couple more questions. Again, these are um, mostly for you, Rick, right here. Um, do you have an idea off the top of your head of your soil test P and K levels? Someone asked about that. Uh, yeah, phosphorus is, is or potassium is around um, uh, 300 to 400 and uh, phosphorus is between 65 and, and 90. Great. And um, another one um, is, um, hold on one second, is, oh, there was a question about, um, you know, if you're planting into your uh, cover crop so late, isn't that going to take N away from your crops? And I know we talked about that a little bit, but could you just like expound upon that again? 
question. Okay. Ask that question. What was the fruit at the beginning? If you're um, planting into your cover crops later when they're mature, aren't you taking N nitrogen away from your crop and without any starter N? That's a good question. Yes. When, when we, you have to be very careful here. Um, cereal rye is a uh, most cereal grains are sequesters of nutrients and especially nitrogen. Um, so yes, if we are going to use cereal rye ahead of corn, it's very, uh, it's, there's a lot more risk involved. You are exactly correct. So what we're gonna probably do is try to uh, terminate or roll that rye down very early in the, in the anthesis process so that we can then get the corn going and establish and, and ask for that cereal rye to release those nutrients back. But also remember with the cereal rye, we've got planted 10 pounds of Bolana uh, hairy vetch and five pounds of fixation clover. So those two together have, have fixed probably upwards of 300 pounds of nitrogen. And we've got more than enough, in my opinion, to get the corn crop started without using a starter fertilizer. But my preference would be to not use cereal rye ahead of corn because of that reason. Great question.